go back again to the goal of our instruction as we look at <clears throat> the verse that actually precipitated this message. It's in 1 Timothy 1, 5. And it simply says in the King James Version, the goal of our instruction is charity. And in the New International Version, it says the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And so we spent some time talking about a sincere faith. We talked about how that hypocrisy is, is absolutely spoken against in, in in the gospel, it's spoken against in the Word of God. We are uh, told to not pretend to have virtues or principles or beliefs that we don't have. We need to be genuine in, in our faith. And so our faith needs to be sincere. It obviously needs to be very real. And then we talked about a good conscience. That good conscience springs from salvation. It, it springs from the fact that we understand and realize that our sins have been forgiven, that he has cleansed us. And, and it's a trick of the devil for us to stay condemned. The scripture tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I, I've often wondered, and actually been thankful for, but I've wondered why then do I remember some of my mess? And I really think it's so that I don't ever want to go back there again. It's not that I'm still condemned. It's that I am forgiven, and I'm so grateful for where he's brought me from. So we need to have a good conscience. It, it needs to be cleansed, it, it, and we can, we can have a guilty conscience uh, and, uh, and our bodies washed with pure water, the Word of God tells us. And then we also looked at a pure heart, and, and I spent quite a bit of time talking about how, does a, how, how do we cleanse our hearts and it's by living according to the Word of God. And so all of that we've talked about. I, I'm not going to try to rehearse it, but I did want to bring it back into your mind. Realizing that all of that is the undergirding for what the goal of our instruction is. And the goal of all of our instruction is, is love. Plain and simple. Uh, when I started this series back in May, I, I, I really didn't think it was going to go into June. And I certainly didn't think it would be going as long as Father's Day. But I honestly think the Lord sort of set me up on this thing. Because part of the purpose of fatherhood is to give instruction to our families and to lead them. And so while this, this sermon absolutely applies to everybody, and I told Janelle... When we were shaking hands, I said, I looked at Janelle, and Bobby was standing right there. I said, Janelle, he couldn't, he couldn't have done it without you. And that's true, because there ain't a father in here that could have done it by himself. <laughs> so, but this, this sermon it applies to all of us, those uh, pre-fathers, that I really want you guys to keep your mess together and keep walking with him. To those fathers that are praying for our grandchildren and soon great-grandchildren. I tell you, it's a, it, it, it's a wonderful thing. But what we, got, what we need to understand is that the goal of what we teach, the goal of what we train, the goal of what everything we're about should be love. And obviously... Don't let the familiarity of this scripture lose anything. Obviously, that's explained extremely well throughout the scripture, but especially in 1 Corinthians 13. So if you look with me at 1 Corinthians 13, let me read and then I'll come back and, and, and have some discussion on each of these characteristics that, are, that make up what God's love is. So let's, uh, let's, let me pray. And then we'll look at 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here. Thank you for a church family. Thank you for men of God. Thank you for men who will lead and, and, and do what you've called us to do. 
And thank you, Lord, for, for our wives and, and, and daughters and, and sons that you have given to us and blessed us with. And I pray that today you will be glorified and that today you might speak to our hearts that we might reflect your loving character to a dying world that so desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. So looking at the word out of 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love's patient. <laughs> now that gets me all the time. I'll come back to it. Love's kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. No record. It does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And this kind of love is the only love, is, is one of the things that I absolutely know never fails. Never fails. When you wonder what to do in a situation when you don't know what to do, love first. Because that's, that, that's, that's going to be what's going to make a difference in whatever situation you find yourself in. Now, as we look at some of these characteristics, and, and I, I certainly don't claim at all to be a, to be a Greek scholar or a, or a theological, I, I'm, I don't consider myself a theologian, but I can read. And there's some smart men have done a lot of research, and I want to share a little bit of that with you today. When you look at this word for patience, the, the King James says that it suffers long. And that word in, in, in the Greek, according to W. E. Vine and, and, and Mr. Strong, means to be long-spirited, forbearing. And then, obviously, it, it means to be patient. So long-suffering and patience, it, I mean, patience is a correct translation of it. Uh, the Beaver Dam version is that it puts up with a lot. <laughs> sometimes it just don't work out like you want it to sometimes things don't don't fall the way you hope they fall and it and when you are walking in love you put up with some stuff now i know that uh and i don't you ladies don't shout me down or anything but um uh y'all work on us pretty good of putting up with it I didn't even get an amen, Colton. I, you guys are playing it safe this morning. I mean, I have to put up with some stuff with Terry. Now, I, I do. And, and I love her. I, I, I do. So I just try to be patient and try to be loving and try not to blow the horn and, uh, and remind her that we got to go. And sometimes she has to do that with me. But we we got to be patient. We've got to be We've got to be kind. We've got to be long-spirited. And that's one of the marks of love, and it gets me, especially when I'm driving. That's when Terry will sometimes say to me, Okay, Pastor. <laughs> she's never said it when she didn't need to. And she's never said it with a demeaning spirit. It's just a gentle reminder that uh, I'm, I am in public. And I don't have to, you know, cut the guy off to cut me off, which I have recently done. She happened not to be in the car. But uh, love needs to be patient. We need to be, we need to be long-suffering. Uh, Vine said this about patience. It's the quality of self-restraint in the face of provocation, which does not hastily retaliate or promptly punish. And that's a mouthful, but that's a good saying. It's the opposite of anger and is associated with mercy. So that's one of the first characteristics that Paul mentions that, that, that love embodies. And, and love embodies way more than just this patience, but, but it, 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 it's extremely important. And frankly, 
one of a couple of areas in here that I really have to practice and work on is to be patient. Terry tells me sometimes it, I, it's amazing to her how patient I can be with people and not with uh, drivers or or sitting in a traffic jam. And well, I don't want to go up. I don't want to live in a city. I couldn't even hardly make it from, from uh, Southport to Shalote yesterday. <laughs> but I was calm. I, I really was. We were stopped and stopped on Highway 17. I, I just sitting there waiting on the traffic to clear up. And I have to work on that. But the love that we have, it helps us. It's not angry. It's associated with mercy. Now, love is kind. Uh, it, it, extremely interesting that the root word of kindness, y'all, is to be useful. That's the root word. It, it, that, now, the word kindness actually extends it to acting benevol- benevolently. But what, what it, I, I found that interesting because kindness is always useful. You can always show up and do something for somebody. You can always look and see something that needed to be done that might be practical or it might be. And, and I just have not actually seen that side of this particular word un, until this particular study. It's, it's almost like the Lord illuminated it to me that kindness is useful. And we need to just simply be kind. There's never an occasion to be unkind. Jesus fashioned a whip and drove them out of the temple. And that was an act of kindness because he was disciplining those who had gotten caught up in what is not about what temple worship is at all. And so there's never an occasion to be, to be unkind. It does not envy. Now, uh, it, it, Mr. Vine said that envy desires to deprive another one of what that other one has. That, that envy, it, it, see, it, it, there's, a, there's a distinction between jealousy. You can be jealous and it be a good thing. God's a jealous God. And, and what that means is that he's not jealous of us, he's jealous for us. Does that make sense? In other words, he loves you and he wants what's best for you and he's going to help you arrive at what's best for you. But envy is the, is the antithesis of jealousy. See, the, 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 that positive side of jealousy is that he loves you, that he's for you, he's not against you. But a bad side of jealousy is where envy comes in and you want to take what somebody else has got or you want to deprive them of it. If you can't have it, at least you don't want them to have it. So, you know, so that, but love doesn't think that way. It's not. It's not envious. And there's a lot of things that, that he describes love as what it's not. Another one is that it, it, it's not proud. No, no, it does not boast it, it is the next one. Now, the idea in boasting, the root word of boasting, is that it goes beyond. So you just get up and stretch it a little bit, you know. You just talk about how good you were when you played ball. And the proof's usually in the pudding. <laughs> but, you know, you can stretch it just a little bit, you know. And, and, and so we don't need to be boastful. Uh, it, it doesn't bring attention to itself. A, a proud person brings attention to themselves. Someone who's walking in love, it, they do it no matter whether there's any attention. And it's not about them it's about somebody else. And primarily, it's about our relationship with the Lord himself. So, uh, love does not boast. <coughs> it, it's not puffed up. Now, that word actually means to inflate, blowing up, to be haughty. It's not proud, not rude. It's not And, and, and that word for rude, see, it, it, it actually, it, the King James calls it unseemly. And I saw what Webster said about unseemly. It, 
it, it's, it's unseemly means, and love is not unseemly, so unseemly is not according with established standards of good form or taste, not suitable for a, the time and place. See, there's a time for all things, but, not, but, but love understands timing. It understands when it's okay to say something and when it's not when it's going to be productive to say it or when you just got to get it off your chest, you know. So you need to, yeah, it, yeah, and, and what we need to do is live somewhat restrained to not offend people on intentionally. Now, the word's going to offend them, but we don't have to be offensive in, in, and, and rude, all right? It, it's not self-seeking. It's not easily provoked. Uh, that word provoked actually means uh, exasperate. And that's something we're going to get to a, a, a little later in this message, the word exasperate. But what we want to do is, is that, and this one really gets me, it keeps no record of wrongs. You get rid of the yeah buts. Yeah, well, I did that, but you did this. Yeah, I, 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 I know, I, I got you, but, but what about this? And so that keeps no record of wrongs, gets rid of the yeah, but attitude that we sometimes bring into relationships, and we're all guilty of it. So I'm not trying to beat us up here today. I'm telling you, he gives us the ability to overcome every one of these characteristics that he's told us not to do. And that's what the good news is. Verse 6 goes on to say in, in 1 Corinthians 13 that it does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Let me remind you that uh, when we rejoice with the truth, we're rejoicing with Jesus because he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So as we rejoice in the truth, we, we don't rejoice when evil wins, we don't rejoice with evil, but we rejoice with the truth. And here, guys, I especially want to talk to the males here, it always protects. Now, you don't have to worry about getting mama bear stirred up. Mama bear's going to protect. But the men of God are told to protect their family, to protect their wife, to protect their, and love always protects. It always trusts. Now, it, I, it didn't say it was always stupid. It didn't say it was always naive, but it's trusting. Now, you don't have to be suspicious about everything. Now, you can be careful. I, uh, there's nothing wrong with looking and walking in and assessing the situation. I just sort of blow on in. Sometimes I, I can be naive, and, and, and it can cost me. But to be trusting is a loving characteristic. It always hopes. Hope's positive. It's looking for a good outcome. It's looking for the right thing. It's not being able to find, I mean, when, if, you, if it always hopes, then that glass is, it might not even be half full, but it's got something in it. <laughs> if you can find something, you know. It always hopes. This one is powerful that it always perseveres. There's no quit in love. No quit. You just keep on. I got people I've had on a prayer list for 49 years still praying for. And you got to keep on. You, you, you keep right on. You keep expecting God to move. You, you don't act in foolishness, but you do believe that God's got every petition you've ever brought to him. At Celebrate Recovery, we got a box full of prayer requests that has never been opened. It's sealed shut. Eight years worth of prayer requests in there. Every Monday night, we pray over that box. <laughs> and just say, God, keep, keep working. Just keep working. Don't quit. And then this love never fails. If you don't know what to do, love. If you're in a situation where you don't know how to treat somebody, treat them with love. Now, that means you may have to tell the truth because you rejoice with the truth. doesn't mean you've got to be a, a doormat. 
and, and, and let folks walk on you. As a matter of fact, that, that, that's not, uh, it's not helping anybody. But we can walk in love. What's extremely interesting is that they, they approached Jesus one time. If you will, go to Mark 12. We're going to look at uh, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? I want to read you this story. It's also in Matthew's gospel, but I wanted to read it out of Mark's translation. In Mark 12, verse 28, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Now, he had just shut the Sadducees down. He really had. And so the, the, evidently this teacher of the law had heard his conversation with the Sadducees. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, so he agreed with what, he, he was a Pharisee, not a Sadducee. And so he, he, he came to the Lord and he said, uh, of all the commandments, which is the most important? He's going to break it down. Just give me, I'm a, I'm a law teacher. What's the most important thing I can teach? The Lord immediately answers out of Deuteronomy. He said the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord. Same word here in the Greek New Testament that Paul told us about in 1 Corinthians 13. We're to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that's a pretty thorough loving there. That means everything you got, you love it. No hidden spaces, no, no, no walking away from it. And then he told us what the second one was. Now, see, we're very familiar with these passages. Don't let the familiarity lose the importance that this is the way we are to live. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I, I got a pretty good opinion of Willard. I, I like Willard. I feed Willard. I try to take care of Willard. I, I wash him, I put on decent clothes. Try to look presentable when I go out. Try to be, you know, I, I, I like Willard fine. But he said, I might better love you as much as I love me. Ever bit as much. Human nature is selfish. God's nature is not. He loved, so he gave. We need to love and we need to give. Well, the teacher of the law said, well, Seth, you're right saying that God is one and that, and that there's no other one but him. So he acknowledged that, 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 that Christ was right. He said to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the Lord went on to tell him he was close said, you, you, you're just about there. Now, to what he was quoting is in Deuteronomy. I want us to look at it because there's something here that I, I really think it's important that we look at on Father's Day. In Deuteronomy 6, he, it's what he was quoting, so I want you to hear it from what Moses said. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Now look at verse 7. And this is why this was a setup for Father's Day. Impress them on your children. Now he's talking to all of the children of Israel. He's talking to the mother. He's talking to the parents. He's talking to everybody. But dads, I want to tell you, we are specifically required to teach our children. And he said, impress them, impress these commandments on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, it ought to be a Bible discussion. You ought to be talking about it. You ought to be able to talk to them. 
And, you know, we tend, and especially uh, children, tend to say, oh, Dad, I, I, you know, I've heard this. Don't give it to me again. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm picking on the Henson boys. <laughs> Don't do that. He's a whole, he, now listen, he's going to get smarter. I promise you, he's going to get smarter. You're going to see it. No, I promise, Ethan. He's, <laughs> he's, he's going to get smarter. But, but, but let the Lord impress it on, we need to impress it. We need to talk about it. When we're walking along, when we're getting up, when we're laying down, when we're walking on the road, and they spend a lot of time walking on the road. Now, you probably spend a lot of time riding down the road. Cut off the iPad. Put up the cell phone. Have some discussion. He went on in verse 8, he said, Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and, and on your gates. And then the word, remember I told you that love talked about not to, to, not to exasperate. Ephesians 6, 4 specifically talks to the fathers. And here's what Paul said to the fathers, he said, fathers, do not exasperate your children. In other words, that's frustrate them, downgrade them, belittle them. This business that you ain't never going to measure up, that's one of the worst things in the world we can tell a young. And we can encourage them, we can be their cheerleader, we need to come alongside them, we need to help them. We need to discipline when we need to. And there's not a perfect father in this room. None of us got it all together. But he said, do not exasperate your children. Instead, now here's what you're to do, and this is how you don't exasperate them. Bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Put it in their heart. They might not, you might not think they're hearing it, but they're hearing it. You might need to demonstrate it to them just as much as you can. And I guarantee you that if you will love them like the Lord loves you, if you love their mother like the Lord loves you, if you love their grandparents like the Lord loves you, they can see that. Then that's why we've got hope for another generation. And I want to close with a quote that Terry got out of one of her study Bibles. She shared it with me. I said, that, 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 that'll preach. Now, I'm not going to reboot here. I'm just going to share the quote with you. It's talking about the fear of the Lord. It's talking about that reverential awe that we're to have for God. Not, not, not a, I don't think he's going to mash me. He mashed Jesus, so I don't have to be mashed. So I'm not fearful in that way. But I have a respect, I, ha I, I have a reverence for God. Here's the quote. <clears throat> and I don't even know who wrote this quote, but it's in Terry's study Bible. I'm not God. I don't get to make up my own definitions of good and evil. Right and wrong. Now think about that. Now, I'm, and this is not the quote, but I'm going to go back to the quote. That's the whole problem. Uh, that's what got us into this mess in the first place. Hath God said? Did he really say? When, when we saw that, and when Adam and Eve saw that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the devil tempted them, because they both ate, with the knowledge of evil. And this quote says, I'm not God. I don't get to make up my own definitions of good and evil, right and wrong. Rather, I need to humble myself before God and embrace God's definition of right and wrong, even when that's inconvenient for me. And that's just a good quote. So, my exhortation to everybody here, but especially the guys, Let's man up. 
Let's instruct our children. You say, well, Willard, mine are grown and gone. No, they still listen. They still listen. You can still bring stuff into their life that's going to make a difference. You still got way more impact than you, than you think you do. And I, I want to encourage us to live according to love, all of us. Read and reread. I, every time I read it, I get convicted. When, when I do any premarital counseling, I go through 1 Corinthians 13 with the couple. And it nails me every time. And I've been working on this for a long time. And I'm going to keep on working. Because what does love do? It always perseveres. I'm going to keep on working. Still working on Willard. Going to keep on working. And so my exhortation to all of us, and especially you fathers, be a man of God. Be a man of God. Speak the truth. Don't hide stuff. Don't try to get away with stuff. Don't think nobody's looking because the Lord sees everything. Let's be men of God. Let's train our children. Let's love our wives. Let's demonstrate this to the world. And I, when, when you mess up, ask the Lord to forgive you and learn another lesson. Stand with me as we sing an invitational hymn. Happy Father's Day. If you need to do any business with the Lord, come settle it today. And y'all have a good evening with your children or with your families or just doing what God's called you to do. 483. If you need to do any business with the Lord, God.